My interest in this started right at the beginning of the 60s by reading a small book by the Pali Tech Society called the, the Yoga Vichara's Manual. At that time, one of the translations was called Manual of the Mystic. And it was a very intriguing little book, but very difficult to understand. We didn't understand it. But there was enough in it to kind of resonate, and it left a kind of lingering curiosity. And that gradually evolved over the years. Then in the 1990s, the, the um, Bezo started to produce um, publications from his researchers in Cambodia and Thailand on palm leaf manuscripts. And one of those was the, um, the Path of Lanka, which had also a, a big effect on a few of us, certainly on me. And those two books, the Yoga Vacharas Manual and the Path of Lanka, give a pretty good idea of the, the main themes of the Yoga Vichara, which, which are, the main themes are as listed here. The first one, the starting point is invocation. The others are a, a, a strong focus on piti, energization, what it means, how to, how to develop it. Then of course the, the jhanas, the, the rupa jhanas and the arupa jhanas. And finally the path. So the Yogacara is describing the full path. And there's the first similarity to the, the Bojangas. It's a slightly um, more practical approach for meditators and particularly for teachers who like to be quite creative in the way they teach and adapt to the, their students. So today's talk then is on the first of these evocation, invocation. That was an interesting slip. There are two words, invocation and evocation, and they both have the same Latin root of vocare, uh, or box, voice, giving voice. But the prefix makes a big difference, in or e, e evocation or invocation. Evocation is it's like you come across something that is very evocative. It's sort of rather like reading the manual, the, the Yoga Vacharas manual. It's very evocative. But you don't really understand it, but it's evocative because it touches on something that at some level we already know. Whereas invocation is, comes from elsewhere, comes from outside. It has to be brought in. It's something we don't know yet something new and so invocation is quite a kind of magical term you know how does that work how do you bring in something new and you find parallels in, in most religions in some form or another there are always in religions ritual and esoteric practices which in, include invocation you come across it as far back as um, in Egyptian uh, books of the dead. You, you come across it in the Tibetan book of the dead. And then lots and lots of Indian and Tibetan tantras and mantras full of invocation. So the, the key theme in invocation is something new. And this is a really central question for meditators. How can we bring something entirely new into our experience that we never experienced before. Completely different to the way we normally work. You know, we think, uh, we think about something which leads to something else and something else. A con continuous process of cognition, subject, object. Nothing really new. We may know a bit more, or we change a little bit of the um, knowledge, but new, anything new? Not, not really. So in jhana, this is where the first challenge comes, because you cannot think, think yourself into jhana, let alone the path. 
because they're quite different to anything in ordinary, everyday sensory consciousness. So we, we have to do it in a way sideways. And this is the interesting way that, that the Yogamachara develops and the invocation develops. So invocation is the starting point. It's rather like Sati was the starting point in the Bhujangas. It establishes a point, a reference point in time and space. So the, the two books that I mentioned, the, yep. the, the Yogacara's manual and the Bethalanka give a, a good idea of what's involved in the invocation. The Yogacara's manual starts off with something we're all familiar with. It, it, it's a recollection of the Buddha, Namo Tassa, taking refuge, um, Itipiso, Svagato, Sabatipano, and then followed by chanting the Metta Sutta, the loving kindness. That's exactly more or less what we've been doing uh, in a very natural way um, over the last many, many years. Most of our practices start in that way. In the manual, this is then followed by a dedication of merit to teachers, supporters, mother, father, all beings, and finally, an aspiration to, towards Nibbana. The Path of Lanka invocation is very similar, but it is in Kurt, Khmer, um, whereas the, the manual is in Sinhala, uh, maybe originally in, in Thai and Mon. But the Path of Lanka is in Khmer, is very, very similar, except that as well as the Sangha, it lists the people who have attained the path, the noble persons, the Tarpanas, Stream Entrance, Sakadagamin, once returners, anagami, non-returners, and arahats. Then this is followed by a request to the twin kamatan, samatha and vipassana. Again, this is a little bit different to the yoga vacharas manual. They, they, they deal with it but in a slightly different way, not particularly in the invocation. So the twin kamatan is an interesting term. It means actually that samatha and vipassana are inextricably linked. Whereas in the reforms in the 50s, when it was claimed that jhana wasn't necessary, um, the result was to separate samatha and vipassana. Again, completely against the original teachings of the Buddha. So the, the invocation recognizes the twin kamatana and requests that the teacher teaches the aspirants the twin kamatana. Again, different to the manual version, there's a section that comes directly from the Mahanikai ordination ritual. And it's written out there, but I don't really particularly want to uh, go into analyzing in detail, except that the first part of the translation underneath, it mentions that the master rejoices in the merits I have acquired, and the master transfers to the merits he has acquired which is actually important. It, it's talking about a, an equality of sharing, a kind of reciprocal relationship, ultimately going towards transmission or sharing development of, towards the path, not so much a rigid hierarchy. And then the last part is a kind of confession, confession of faults, very, very similar to what happens in the monkhood on the full moon day when before reciting the Patimokha, the rules for a monk, monks perform, after shaving their heads, a kind of ritual confession, um, one to another. Again, it doesn't matter particularly about the hierarchy, you just choose another monk, formulate the ritual confession of whatever, whatever you think you may have um, not attended to sufficiently in the previous month, then you reverse roles. And finally, the assembly of monks is ritually purified in that way and listens to the recitation of the Moka. So in the invocation, it's like a kind of preparatory recollection of the uh, lineage, teachers, and then a kind of preparation by um, purification before actually getting into the, the practices. So... 
they're all written out in those two books. But it doesn't mean in practice someone learns them and has to recite them or any kind of practice. It might start like that. It might start, it's just a starting point. The words are only a starting point. Um, eventually it becomes much more setting in the mind a direction. It's more like a mental act. It establishes a direction just like uh, Sati did in the, in the Bhujangas. And all the stages of these rituals that follow, they start with the word Okasa, which is also like a short form of invocation. Okasa means let it be manifest. It's related to the, the same root of uh, Akasa, space, in the first Arupajana. Um, so it's almost like letting something become manifest out of the primordial space. But I don't want people starting to shout Okasa at the beginning of any practices I take. I think it might be a bit disturbing a bit. So you just do it quietly in your, in your mind. And actually what, what we're talking about as this becomes non-verbal is getting familiar with you know, what in genre is called the, the fine material level. It's, it's all to do with experience of feeling, much less words. It's to do with discerning a kind of underlying form. So I'm conscious of talking in these talks and the Bhajangas with a lot of words. But actually, the important thing is when you're thinking about it and listening, um, the words are not really important. It's what they evoke in the form which you can feel. And so the moment of invocation, the moment of sati, becomes a kind of um, search for direction and meaning. So just like the Bojangas, Invocation develops sati, um, dhamma-vichaya, understanding, and, and dhirya, an interest. And further than that, it's going to lead on to, just like the Bhujangas, if invocation is done correctly, it'll lead on to an, an energization, um, tranquilization, a simplifying, a samadhi, and finally a peka. And again, there's something very intriguing about how you make a starting point, like sati in the Bhujangas and invocation in the Yoga Vachara. And already, as soon as we take that step, that mental act of setting up a starting point, at some level, there's an awareness of a completion. And this again is to do with the, you know, the level of form. Um, the sense of time is not as crude as in sensory consciousness. It's not limited to a linear order. So at some level when we perform an invocation, you know, you may be doing your own practice, you quietly recollect something very, very simple to give you a sense of direction. There's already a path unfolding ahead. And that's what the, we're talking about in these talks, how it all comes together, just like the Bojangas came together. Another way of looking at it, the more, probably the most simple way we experience invocation is if you think back to your first contact with your teacher. Normally at that point, and I'm sure many, many, probably most of you will remember your first contact. There's something which you connect to, um, which is different to maybe what you've experienced before, and you become interested enough to want to learn more, enough to make a connection with that teacher and practice meditation. And of course, if the teacher has had some experience of the path, then you're very lucky because you've already got the first stage almost done automatically without any kind of thought, without any kind of reading. You may know nothing about Buddhism. 
And so that would be the, the simplest kind of level of invocation, which we owe a kind of lot of gratitude to our teachers for that, which is why in the invocation, we pay respect not just to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, but the whole line of teachers down to your teacher. And actually then yourself as teacher, if you're, if you're teaching others. It's a tradition which can continues one to another. And in each stage, when something is known and passed on, there's an equality. What the teacher knows comes to be known by you. And at that point, you're quite equal. <coughs> so, bearing all that in mind and forgetting all the words, let's um, now have a practice. So we practice for about um, 20 minutes, maybe a bit longer. I'll sound the bell at the beginning and then at the end. And at the end of the practice, <coughs> I'd ask you to stay with the stillness before you open your eyes. Not think about what you experience, but feel it. And just feel it with, um, with curiosity and kind of Dhamma Vichaya, and you know where you've been. So do your own practice in whatever way you want, through the um, whatever length of breath you want. Um, and then we'll maybe have some time for comments at the end. So, staying with the stillness at the end of a practice is very important to get a feel and understand where you've been. It's also important because when you now come back to engaging um, with each other in this situation, if anything comes to mind that um, you want to voice, please do. And no need for anyone to respond, at least for the first two or three, maybe even four comments. Usually it starts to all connect and um, we take it from there. Well, this is quite scary to um, come forward and speak in, in this way on, on this, um, in this form. Mm. But there is something I really want to actually express and it's something that I've been working with. And, and as I came out of the meditation, I started to become aware of what I was actually finding difficulty with or a kind of ambiguous kind of um, dance that was happening where I felt, um, I started to realize that it's, it's difficult for me to allow myself to enjoy to find pleasure in my body. So coming into the pity stage, it's sort of like, oh, it's kind of like there's an, a bit of anxiety there. The mind gets a bit busy, but then I think, oh, no, okay, just, just find pleasure in you know, the sensations in my body. And it's a sort of a bit of a dance between the two. It's sort of a, oh, can I allow myself to really almost like sunbathe in this, <laughs> oh, receive the pleasure. And it's sort of like I'm starting to realize that that's, that's, that's a piece of work in itself or allowing, it's a sort of allowing myself that pleasure so I can really become more embodied. Uh, does this make sense to you? <laughs> So that's where I am. Yeah. And I know that to this, you, yeah, I think that's as much as I can say, as I dare to say at the moment, because it just feels very um, scary to make myself kind of 
to expose myself here, to make myself vulnerable. Well, thank you for doing so, because for you and anyone else, you can be absolutely sure that whatever comes up after a group practice like that will be re very relevant to uh, pretty well everyone. So don't tell me a doubt about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I've not particularly come across the idea of invocation, but in practice, I think I've kind of found myself doing something like that when I do the ETP so, where I, between each of the phrases, I take a slow, long in breath and then the next one. And it's kind of, it feels like it's, it's a, a recollection, but it's also an invocation. It's an opening to something which kind of lifts the beginning of the practice. So it's kind of like an invo invocation. It's an opening to. What came to mind just towards the end of the practice was um, that everything is actually an invocation. Everything, all of life is an invocation in the sense of allowing everything to just be and um, not closing it down. Uh, yes, it's on me. Um, I think at first I started experiencing a pity and it was a natural kind of, uh, um, yeah, it's a phenomena uh, to experiencing. Now I'm experiencing that the pity, sometimes my thoughts come first, or maybe I would like to have a kind of that pity and then that the pity arise and I'm wondering am I manip manipulating to you know instead of a natural kind of uh, kind of uh, phenomena or I'm psychologically manipulating uh, there was a thought came up in response to Chris, and I think it's also relevant to what his Sammy said, but I was very struck, I have been struck in the past as well, by the fact that the invocation isn't just uh, like a, a passive request for something to come. It also includes an aspiration as well, that you you chant the verses of aspiration. And interestingly, uh, it, Paul didn't mention it with the thing about taking refuge uh, in the invocation in the Yoga Vachara's manual, that the refuge is slightly different to the way we normally take it, because there's an aspiration in that as well. And it seems that there's something about working with that sort of slightly active and slightly passive way of doing things. It isn't just a request for, you know, something to come, as it were. So it um, just seemed relevant to mention. So, Leslie Ann? Hi, I wonder if you could help me. When we, not always, but when um, going through the, the stages, sometimes between um, touching and settling, I get a very warm feeling that sort of arises in my body. It, it's, brief, it's briefish, but it's, it's warmness. And I think, oh, that's pity. Is it, I, I don't know. Somebody will have to tell me. It's a warmthness, and then it comes, and then it goes. It's not there all the time. It's it's brief, but I feel it's joyous, joyful. Is that correct? I don't. Somebody indicate to me if it is. Well, some other people have this experience. 
Uh, it sounds, hello Leslie Ann. Hi, Rocky. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, uh, it sounds like it to me. That's all I can say to you. It sounds, that's so, certainly my instinct says it sounds very much like it. Um, it's, it's, it yeah, it, it, it's different for different people, isn't it? And how it manifests. So, um, but it's, 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 uh, if it, if it, feels like it is then it probably is <laughs> trust it <laughs> would be my thought <laughs> does anybody else have this i don't know it, you, but some lady's shaking her head yes sarah yeah okay good <laughs> thank you could, could i add a comment and, and as well if there's nobody is that all right mark to, on a sli slightly in a slightly different topic, but it was something I wanted to uh, an observation or a sort of uh, a sense I had was, and it was in connection with I, the, I've been when I've been practicing, I've been doing a lot of Nibhuman's sort of the Brahma Viharas, incorporating them into practice in various ways. So you know, linking counting and um, meta and following and compassion and mudita, uh, sympathetic joy in the touching and then equanimity in the settling. And it struck me this time, it's almost as though uh, the counting is something like um, the way you, you talked about a link between sati and the invocation, but and then at the following, it, what, what came up very much when, when, when the sense of compassion came up was um, the bit that you talked about with the monks, the uh, the forgiveness section, that it was almost like uh, there's that that beautiful going into the practice that can happen. Um, it's sort of almost like it, there's a natural unfolding where, which enables you one if one lets it to to go in in the right frame of mind heart and. That, that's something to do with a link with what you were talking about. And so that when you get to the touching and the joy in one's, one's actions, whether it's your own or other people's, um, it's almost like, so you can put down all past misdemeanors and all the rest of it. it sounds a bit Christian, doesn't it? But you put down all past misdemeanors and sort of, uh, and, and sort of be with all the good actions in cleanliness. Yeah, I think sort of was a thought that came in. And then in Upeka, equanimity in the settling, what will be will be kind of sense, although it's more active than that, isn't it? So. <laughs> um, yes, I was just wondering um, where um, Sangha comes into the invocation, because for me, uh, these um, Saturday mornings, um, I, I do find that my practice is a good practice, whatever that is, but it feels really quite um, strong or deep or something. And I, I always have a very strong feeling towards um, all the good friends that I see um, on, on Zoom and, of course, my teacher. Um, and it, it seems to have an effect on my practice, is what I'm saying, I think. Uh, there seems to be some kind of, even through this, you know, through the ether, as we are, we're seeing each other, it, there seems to be some kind of um, strength or or um, power or something that, that comes from being with uh, people that I've known a long time and who are friends in, the, in, in, in practice. So I... I I just wondered if, you know, I was thinking in terms of that being part of the invocation in a way, the, the Sangha. Yeah. I think, that, I think that's right. I mean, the, to begin with, right at the beginning, you know, 50 years ago, we were very um, new to this. So we might have had connection one or two of us with food. <clears throat> but then it all unfolds. And like I was describing, the first connection with your t first teacher is, is the kind of very clean, very clear 
it kind of evoke, evoke something, something that connects between the two. Now I think what you're saying is absolutely right, Marjorie, that uh, it's like a shortcut when we when we join a group like this, whether it's virtual or, or face-to-face in the, in the shine room. <coughs> There's no doubt it. it is really helpful. Um, it takes us straight to the language, which is what the invitation is really about. It's just another aspect where the Sangha carries it. And the same thing, the example I gave about the, the monks um, meeting every month to recite the Pati Mokka. The first time I was part of that, as a monk, I was really struck how you could have a, a completely mixed bag of characters among the monks. Some of them, you know, very, very sincere, some of them very uh, knowledgeable, but also some people who uh, come in for all sorts of different reasons, maybe for the uh, three month range retreat. And there were even, you know, some rather dubious characters, frankly, who, who come from escaping situations, domestic um, debt, maybe the wars in Burma. But yet, they would have shaved their head and then gone through the kind of ritual purification, confession that I was talking about. I couldn't really recognize them in the same way as who they were. Sudden, suddenly, it was a group of 200 monks, and it was the Sangha. And then you can see what the lineage is really about, protected by that mon- monthly recitation of Pati Rocket. We're in a different situation. This is a you know, lay tradition, but we now have more than 50 years of all sorts of activities. And gradually from out of this, there's something that you can connect to, as you just said. And so there's already a kind of sense of this lineage. So it's not all that difficult to just connect, just to go there, just to connect to it. <coughs> so thinking of the themes that, that people would be talking about, the comments are very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I think there are two things. One is this one we talk about now to do with lineage. And um, also, as um, Ian and um, Chris were talking in different ways, Ian mentioned about aspiration. And Absolutely, that's very important because in, in our everyday consciousness, we're evoking and evoking unconsciously all the time a continuity of I, which may not always be very skillful. But the difference when we turn towards communication in this sense, in ultimately towards the path, has to be an aspiration. And if we don't know much about what we're aspiring to, to begin with, we call on the lineage from the past, and that gives a sense of the beginning, that direction. And, and of course, you can also help it by the Brahma Viharas, from time to time, an awareness of compassion, um, of the fact that you're not really any different to anyone else, that everyone suffers. So. The invocation is absolutely an aspiration different to the, to the normal conditioning processes that determine the direction of sensory consciousness. It's a stepping out of it. And it's a stepping out of it, ultimately towards jhana, where we're not controlled by uh, thinking of this or that. We're not controlled liking or disliking, or wanting or not wanting. And then you come to the second theme, two or three people were talking about that kind of very delicate point where we start to experience something. One person mentioned um, um, the beginnings of sukkah, 
actually, it begins at the sense of the body and happiness within it and the difficulty of actually embracing that sometimes when logically we should be embracing it and very happy, but we don't. Why is that? It's very interesting. And it's like the, the little voice creeps in at that point, which takes us slightly outside it, back towards the habits of, of, of thinking about it. And this is so typical as you're on the threshold of jhana. There's a little bit can easily just pull you back into sensory consciousness, thinking about it. Are we allowed yet to just be content with where we are? Or should we be doing something else? So it's such an interesting point, and we're working with it all the time until you get more and more confident about it's okay to be content. It's actually very simple. And then there's a relief in letting go of the habits and you go a bit deeper. It becomes all embracing. And you're then on the process, you're in the process. Um, a couple of other people described it in different ways. We all experience it, it's that subtle pull at the point where we're not quite sure yet of how to stay with the, uh, the form how to stay with the, the feelings and the contentment without being pulled back into commenting on it or thinking about it in some way. But it's, it's very close to being content and then letting go into that, it becomes more familiar, etc., etc. And that's why I think it's so important to stay with the stillness at the end of practice because you find that almost inevitably when you've been practicing for a couple of years or more, that there will be moments like that, but you easily forget them. Uh, well, I just, one thing that came to mind, um, actually in what many people have said, um, has been the, uh, the quality of um, adverting, the, the first of the masteries, and that almost invocation um, is a way, uh, and actually what Paul was just saying about the sort of teetering on the edge and that little voice, it, uh, adverting is when the voice stops and you just go in, and the invocation is almost a way of, a of helping the mind establish that um, uh, from the start, and perhaps uh, as it, if it wanders off throughout the practice to, to, to re-establish that direction even if it is to something you don't really know what you're um, directing to. And in a way, you know, all these comments are so helpful because they give slightly different perspectives. And then out of all those different perspectives, the, the sense of what we're actually talking about, what we're trying to advert to or connect to, or trust becomes a little bit clearer and the the group as a group as a whole can be you know extremely helpful in that. just like when you're sitting in a group it becomes a, almost a collective um, endeavor um i thought it was interesting that paul's first slide had the footprint and that came to mind quite strongly for me at the um start of the practice and we have our kind of usual kind of views about where is the mind and where do we think from and all these different views about how we construct ourselves. But it felt quite useful almost to kind of let go of that idea of where the mind and body are and see them more as a kind of integrated whole. And that sense of if you go to the feet that you can have that sense of connecting from top of the body to the bottom of the body and also the feet are one of our main ways to connect through to the earth and somehow I think reflecting what others have said if you're making an invocation you can almost kind of call the earth to witness and that somehow can give a kind of confidence when we're getting to those points where you feel a little bit uncertain because the earth has kind of witnessed everything already <laughs> um, it's new to us but it's not new to the earth somehow and that can allow 
something to somehow become a bit more firmly established and that sense of strength to be there. So I found that quite helpful, that that image of the footprint um, in that kind of process uh, this morning in the practice. Yeah. I find it a very evocative image too, that uh, it brings to mind for me that the, the kind of uh, impression that's left by a footprint, in this case by the footprint of the Buddha. It's a long, a long, long time since he, he walked on uh, arms rounds or on, uh, um, whatever. But there's, there's still a, a footprint, an impression there behind what we do. Charles, Charles Shaw. Thanks, Mark. Um, just following up on Marjorie's point about, about the Sangha, because um, there's some reason I've been thinking a lot recently about when we, t first of all, what is it, what does it mean to take refuge? But in particular, um, why do we take refuge in the Sangha? And there's something, um, in a sense, you can see, you can see it. it's there's something relatively obvious or straightforward about why we might want to take refuge in the Buddha and the Dhamma. But why, why the Sangha and what is the role? But actually, um, there seems something absolutely crucial about the Sangha in relation to keeping the whole thing going, because in a sense, without, I mean, Sangha in this sense, without the Sangha, the community of those who have actually followed and realized the path, then in a sense, the other two have no meaning because there would be, they, there would be no point of access, there would be no presence at the moment, nothing to follow. It would just be something that came and went. So, um, so yes, I think, I think thinking about the, the importance of the Sangha and the role it plays is, is very, uh, very interesting, mm. very important for me. Yeah, yeah, me too. And I think we, we, we live it in a way by what we've created in the last 55 years. Mm. Yeah. You know, we didn't really understand, or I, I, I certainly didn't understand anything really about Sangha in that sense. But you can see it visibly now, you know. And so then you get a sense of it in reality because it's developed through all those years from all of us. And, and then there's the other side in the bigger picture, which I think is really <coughs> quite important to know about. Because the, the Sangha is what protected the, the Dhamma, the teachings. And it becomes so clear, you know, in the monastic setting, how that's symbolized by the Patimokkha every month. And then you start to really see in the monastic setting, we're seeing how it works now in a lay setting, which is absolutely fascinating where it can develop naturally in this way, based on meditation practice. That's where it connects back to the lineage. But in the Sangha, in the monastic Sangha, I thought a lot about what happened with, you know, what Naibhuma was taught, and this sort of re-emergence of the old traditions, and how it was on the threshold of being really broken because there'd been a modest monastic lineage for centuries in, in Southeast Asia. Very, very strong. Strong enough so that when it broke down in Ceylon, the ties could go and re-establish it. This had been going on for centuries. And because of doubt creeping in in the 1800s and to the difficulties of engaging with Western scientific ideas and all that, the Sangha split, and from the 1830s right up to the 1950s, there was a really difficult tension between the two Buddhist sects in Thailand. And so they couldn't really resist what came in from Burma, in Burmese Vipassana. I'm quite sure several people have written about it. Um, and the Sangha was weakened in its capacity to con contain the lineage. I think we came very close to really 
you know, the, the, the kind of um, comments that sometimes have been made that the demo will eventually, how will it eventually fade and break? And probably if the Sangha loses that capacity. So what we've got in the lay Sangha now is very different to the monastic Sangha, but we can already see, you know, Lance has died, Nibuman is not very well at the moment. We're all getting older, but there's a collective now. There's everyone, like the comments people have made today, there's a lot of really interesting insights within our Sangha that gradually you can connect to this and trust them. Like Marjorie was saying. Izzy, I think, do you want to say something? <clears throat> um, yes, and it's interesting because Paul has just used the word that I was going to bring in. Um, things that have sort of come together for me during the, the past hour or, or so. Um, well, the, whole, the, the time that we've been on at this meeting. The, the word, what I wrote down was my reason for wanting to practice in the first place. I was having um, a very interesting conversation with some friends the other day, non-Buddhist friends, and, and they were asking about what, what brought me to Buddhism. And of course, at the time, I didn't know it was Buddhism that I was getting into. But anyway, what brought me to practice, let's say. And actually what it was, was a very strong sense of being disconnected. I wouldn't have found those words at that time, but that's actually what it was. It was about being disconnected from nature, from people, from the world around me. And I was really looking for something which... I didn't know what I was looking for, but it arose out of that sense. And when Paul was talking earlier about evocation and that word okasa, which comes from the, um, the Pali for space, akasa, that let something be manifest. For me, that, that's something that's really resonated today because Paul used a phrase and I didn't write it down, but it was something along the lines of um, your evoking um, a, a strong wish, a strong, you know, Ian, Ian talked about it in terms of it's not just passive, it, it involves something from within, as it were, um, a, a connection with a, a wish for something to be manifest. And I think Paul said something like, out of the space from which all arises, something along those lines. And again, in contrast to Gwil, who's talking about the earth, now I'm just bringing in the space thing, that sort of, that evocation of that, because what that seems to me to bring about is a sense of non-separation or connection. And for me, that's very much what, what this work is about for me at the moment. And as Paul quite rightly said, you can't think yourself into it, but there is something quite magical about that evoking that can almost like a blinding flash bring something into being that is not within our normal sphere of consciousness or, or the way we we work in the sort of the dualistic world if you like so for me that's something that's come out of today's meeting it's sort of been expressed i hope i'm not going to formalize it now but i can let it go that's it. Thank you. What part visualization have in the development of the stillness of mind? Could you say that again? Visualization. What part it plays in developing stillness does it have much part visualization visualization of anything in particular anything to develop stillness of mind i think a lot of it depends on temperament um but in in the in some traditions where people visualize um, the buddha for example <coughs> you may start with maybe quite a difficult cognitive exercise, but as you get familiar with maybe gazing at a Buddha image, 
the point where you connect to it is where the, there's a feeling connection, rather like uh, Isabel was just saying. You might connect to, for example, something in the posture of a Buddha image might give you a sense of real strength and stillness. And then if you allow that to simply be and become one with the experience, that's the connection that Isabel was talking about, then that for some people is a, is a way into um, feeling connected to folk stillness. Um, and this is why I'm quite sure in some traditions, particularly Tibetan traditions, it's a big part of the, the practices. In the yoga vichara too, in the, for example, but before I say what I was going to give as an example, I think with, with visualization, <clears throat> it's probably quite important for most of us to go through the, the, the basic preparatory stages, for example, of counting, following, touching, and second. Because otherwise, if we're not sufficiently disengaged from thinking and labeling and judging, visualization is actually quite difficult. It becomes partly recognition in, on the, in a cognitive sense. But if you turn to it after you've got some experience of the basic practice, it becomes quite different. It becomes, it becomes an evocation, inv invocation, evocation, whatever. I could be either. Of taking in some quality to your practice. You know, in the same way that we get into the Brahma Maras, which is a kind of invocation, we're recollecting something or someone that has the quality of, of metta or compassion and we take that in and so yeah it can, it can be very 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 helpful in the yoga vichara since we're talking about the yoga vichara it also has its role um particularly at the point of we'll talk about it in a few weeks time particularly at the point of how does the path arise? I mean, it's one thing to think about jhana, which we'll be doing over the next few talks. How do we allow ourselves to move towards jhana? We can't think ourselves into it. With the path, even more, even more important question, how does the path arise? But there's a point at which the path arises beyond beyond the whole process of being invocation and practice, which is called conformity. And it's rather like meditating on the Buddha, um, but it happens in a, in a more subtle way in, in, in meditation. But in meditating on the Buddha, if, the, if you grasp the whole quality of the Buddha image in all its aspects, then it may lead to a experience where the meditator becomes almost a, a Buddha. It becomes it becomes a felt experience where nothing is nothing is no question is an answer, and at that point it may become real. I don't know that. Either. Francis. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I was I was um, just thinking, and it um, kind of reflects really. Um, one of the people have said that, the, in a sense, the invocation is to do with making a connection um, to something, and perhaps to the um, to the lineage. But um, but how you make that connection. Um, and what is sort of remarkable is the many different ways people have just produced over the last 10 minutes of different ways of doing that, of actually making that connection, mm -hmm. whether it's with the earth or space or the sangha or, or just kind of many different ways. And that how there seem to be two, two aspects. One is sort of seeing the, the helpfulness of doing that at the start. There's something, as, as people have said, that's the sort of quick way in. And another way is the sort of creativity 
because that's in a way what's been shown here. Mm. But actually, the same invocation may may not be right um, on each of um, on each occasion, and the kind of create and the kind of creativity in being able to find uh, the kind of right way for the right moment um, may be useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just maybe adding another way, perhaps, of making that connection um, together with with all the the other things that people have mentioned. Um, I found it quite useful over the last few weeks to bring about um, uh, or bring to mind the experience of um, stillness or the experience of having had that contact with what is kind of fine material, I suppose, um, by bringing either the actual experience to mind or bringing to mind perhaps the place where it was experienced. Um, and that, I don't know if you'd call it evocation or invocation, um, but it, it seems to have that similar effect of making the connection. Mm. Mm. I think once you've got a glimpse of something, it becomes a mixture of invocation and evocation. You can evoke something when you're familiar with it very quickly. And go there. I think the creativity that you're talking about Francis is really, really interesting too, because I don't know whether I'm, I'm sure other people have noticed that the more you can experience the stillness, the point where you come out of that, coming back to the world, as it were, is is full of possibilities. And some people describe to me getting um, very, very interesting, very creative ideas, sometimes very practical creative ideas too, but it's something like the stillness and then coming out of it is so wide open that depending on what question comes in, it can be just a really creative space. On, in comparison to the difficulty we have in everyday life, where um, we're mostly much more restricted in the, in the space we live in. So we might make an attempt to be creative, but that's quite, it's quite limited compared to the kind of complete openness after, after that contact with stillness and meditation. And I guess another parallel is, is that's also saying something about how samatha is related to vipassana. Vipassana is ultimately extremely creative. If it's something totally new that's never been experienced before, it can't be more creative than that. <laughs> maybe. Is that a, maybe a good point to to end, because all the comments as I feel them and experience them is, is just right. right. I can't see anybody. It's just right. I think you're quite, you're quite content. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to sign off. And... Um, Next week, we'll be talking about the start to talk about the Rupa Charms. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.